the anti-intellectualism of kierkegaard by david swenson 1876 to 1940 published in 1916 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the anti-intellectualism of kierkegaard the aim of the present paper is twofold to give an introductory characterization of kierkegaard's individuality as a thinker and to elucidate in some detail the epistemological position from which the paper takes its title this position i have characterized as anti-intellectualism in order to establish a point of contact with present-day currents of thought but i warn the reader that kierkegaard resists a facile classification and that one cannot without danger of misunderstanding transfer impressions derived from a study of james or bergson unmodified to the interpretation of this most profound and original thinker the introductory section of the paper deals briefly with kierkegaard's style and method of writing in its relation to his philosophical ideas with his doctrine of indirect communication as the consistent form of a reflectively conscious protest against intellectualism and with the method and program of his constructive philosophy of values footnote soaring by kierkegaard a danish thinker eighteen thirteen to eighteen fifty five author of an extensive ascetic ethical and religious literature the latest edition of his collected works was published in copenhagen in nineteen hundred and four under the editorship of e b drachman et al references in the article apply to the separate volumes of this edition a german translation in twelve volumes has recently been published by eugen diedrich in jena george brandes s k leipzig eighteen seventy nine offers a critical analysis of the kierkegaardian literature in its ascetic aspects hofting s k als philosoph stuttgart nineteen hundred and two deals with his philosophical position End footnote although the author of a literature rich in philosophical content kierkegaard wrote no systematic treatise on pure logic or metaphysics it most often happens that philosophical writers who thus wear the less professional air have their treasures of truth so submerged in feeling or so suffused with imagination that their position is not abstractly clear and consequently not readily susceptible of a sharp definition but in kierkegaard we have a rare combination of dialectical power with an imaginative and dramatic intuition so that picturesque characterization in the concrete is to be found in his writing side by side with exact and algebraic definition his native dialectical powers were disciplined by a serious study of hegel and though emancipating himself from the tyranny of hegel's dominant influence he acquired through his aid the mastery of a precise and finished terminology the absence therefore of any systematic treatise covering the logical and metaphysical disciplines is due not so much to a limitation or a peculiarity in his genius as to the nature of his philosophical position indeed it is the deliberate expression of a well-considered choice the carefully planned application of a corrective against one-sided and abstract intellectualism this feature of his thought makes his ideas extremely difficult to convey at second hand since the task resembles the translation of poetry where the form is inseparable from the content one is constantly exposed to the danger of utterly failing to interpret the spirit of his philosophy in spite of having correctly transcribed its chief salient propositions a danger which the reader will note is somewhat ironical in its nature 
kierkegaard calls himself a subjective thinker his meaning may perhaps be conveyed in one of its aspects by calling him also an artist thinker for he strove constantly to reduplicate his reflection in an artistic form attempting to assimilate and transmute its objective content so as to make it serve the purposes of a communication in which due regard should be had both to the giver and to the receiver this care for the subjective elements in communication demands that thought should be doubly reflective by the first reflection it then attains to its ordinary and direct expression in the word or phrase and by the second reflection it receives an indirect expression in style and form as the concrete medium of human intercourse such an indirect expression inasmuch as it is the result of reflection is artistic and such a thinker is therefore an artist in another and higher sense than that which is implied by the possession of mere literary skill kierkegaard maintains the validity and necessity of this twofold reflection whenever the subject matter to be communicated concerns reality in its most concrete aspect as rooted in the very nature of reality itself and as grounded in the fundamental relation between objective thought and real existence reality is such that a form of communication may be chosen which contradicts the very thought that it assumes to convey thus transforming the supposed communication into a non-communication i cannot undertake to convey within the limits of this paper an idea of the literary resourcefulness the reflective ingenuity the keenness of irony and profundity of humour the variety and multiplicity of forms and devices that give to kierkegaard's writings their peculiar individuality of stamp and colouring as a consequence of the method described as double reflection one expression of the method is the absence of a volume of pure logic or metaphysics from the list of his published works the principle by which this choice was guided i wish briefly to explain the problem of reality is of course in one sense or another the problem of all philosophy and it was also kierkegaard's central problem as a student of the philosophy of his day he soon began to feel like many other students in his day and our own the inadequacy of what philosophers are accustomed to say on this all-absorbing topic what philosophers say under the heading of reality he complains in one of his aphorisms is sometimes as illusory as a sign displayed in a window clothes pressed here if you enter the shop to have your clothes pressed you are disappointed to learn that the sign is held for sale and that clothes are not pressed on the premises philosophers tend to forget that the categories which are usually the first to attract their attention and to which objective thinking is apt exclusively to devote itself namely the logical and the metaphysical are not as such the categories of reality the entities of metaphysics and the forms of logic do not exist as such when they exist they exist as embedded in the flesh and blood of the ascetic the ethical and the religious their reality or being is not identical with the reality of factual existence but they constitute an abbreviation of or a prius for the above three fundamental spheres of existence hence it is that no man lives in categories that are purely logical or metaphysical but exists on the contrary in categories that are ascetic ethical or religious in their nature a philosopher thoroughly conscious of this fact should be impelled to give his intercourse and his writings the stamp of a broad and sympathetic humanism he will certainly wish to bear in mind that a philosopher is not only sometimes a man as a greek sceptic once frankly confessed but always and essentially a man 
in the attempt to express this consciousness kierkegaard made his work approximate as nearly as possible the essential features of the living reality now in the concrete the logical both is and is not being embedded in life's moral substance hence the skeleton of kierkegaard's own logical position was likewise embedded and hidden in a certain thickness to use a significant expression of james it was wrapped up in a covering of humour wit pathos and imagination and interwoven with mimic and lyric expressions of doubt despair and faith so that we have presented before us instead of a mere logical web of paragraphs a thinking personality who exists in his thought the subjective is shown appropriating and using the objective on this account the style has a certain breadth an unsystematic lingering ease of conversational tone and there is displayed a pregnant and decisive energy of acceptance or repudiation which is unusual in philosophical composition but which brings us incomparably nearer to the breath of life pascal has noted that there are few who show themselves able to speak of doubt doubtingly or faith believingly or modesty modestly it is no slight tribute to the noble simplicity of william james as a thinker that he put in practice so large a measure of what he had learned to understand and actually taught pragmatism in a pragmatic spirit a student of kierkegaard is in like manner impressed by the fact that his doctrine and method and spirit are consonant and may be called genuinely pragmatic in a high and noble sense in kierkegaard abstract logical thought is not merely dogmatically described as having an instrumental function but it is actually made to perform its duty as instrumental it is every moment held in subjection to a realistic aim moreover so concrete is the conception of this realistic aim so reflectively apprehended are the difficulties in the way of its actualization that the problem which it sets gives rise to a philosophical theory of the art of communication respecting it this theory seeks to define the nature and limits of the mutual dependence of individuals upon one another in such a way as to exhibit and respect their real and ultimate independence the theory is expressed and summarized in the category of indirect communication which is the logical outcome of the method of double reflection and the consistent consequence of the thoroughgoing anti-intellectualism which kierkegaard represents footnote a study of professor royce's problem of christianity reveals an interesting parallel between the category of interpretation as developed by him and kierkegaard's doctrine of indirect communication these two categories play analogous and central roles in two antithetical views of life and reality kierkegaard's conception of christianity is therefore the precise opposite at every essential point of that offered by professor royce interpretation is direct and positive is an expression for objective certainty and is related despite strenuous efforts to avoid the implication to an essentially static view of life indirect communication is a negative expression for an underlying positive principle involves the denial of objective certainty and is related to an essentially dynamic view of life to take one illustration of many royce has a doctrine of the spirit in the community but does not make paramount the question of how the community comes to be since for him it simply is he does not ask how the spirit comes to constitute the community or to dwell in it when this question is raised and answered as kierkegaard would answer it by an insistence upon the primacy of the individual and a recognition of the fact that the spirit must first come to dwell in the individual in order to dwell in and constitute the community 
instead of vice versa then the life of the individual is turned inward rather than outward and is made inwardly and therefore radically dynamic the relation to god becomes prior to and fundamental to the relation to humanity instead of an ambiguous variant expression for the latter or a powerless shadow of it and the distinction between pantheism and theism receives its true significance End of footnote. that communication on the subject of the highest and most concrete phase of reality must necessarily be indirect has its ground according to kierkegaard in the fact that the actualization of the real is always in process and also in that independence of the individuals which makes any essential discipleship a false relation it is an expression for the ethical isolation which makes it impossible to judge of an individual justly or with unconditional certainty by means of any code of general rules or laws finally it is a consequence of the metaphysical incommensurability between the particular and the universal language being the vehicle of the abstract and the universal reality being essentially concrete and particular when communication deals with the abstract or with such aspects of the concrete as can be apprehended through essentially valid analogies i e the whole realm of purely objective thinking there is no good reason why it should not be direct and positive but when it attempts to deal with the absolutely individual and concrete i e the realm of the ethico religious inwardness its apparent positive and direct character is illusory such communication becomes real only on condition that its negative aspect is brought to consciousness and embodied in the form a lover for example may feel the need of telling others of his love though he also feels that he neither desires to convey nor is able to express its deepest and most intimate secret and that which is only relatively true in the case of the lover since a lover's experience has analogies is absolutely true for the ethical religious individual a concrete subjective thinker like socrates has no positive result that can be truly or adequately conveyed by a formula or a sum of propositions he has only a way he has never finished and he cannot therefore positively communicate himself a protest against intellectualism needs a category of this kind in order to free itself from the last vestige of subservience to the dominance of the principle of identity in my opinion kierkegaard was the first critic of intellectualism who burned his philosophical bridges behind him and thereby liberated himself from the trammels of the intellectualist application or misuse of logic in the world of life and reality certainly not the first to discover the category in question or the first to use it he was nevertheless the first as far as i am aware to give it a clear and dialectical formulation what i have said about it here is simply for the purpose of calling attention to the concept and does not pretend to play the part of an exposition james characterizes intellectualism as the claim that conceptual logic is the final authority in the world of being or fact and as the assertion that the logic of identity is the most intimate and exhaustive definer of the nature of reality footnote a pluralistic universe pages two hundred and thirteen to two hundred and twenty end of footnote kierkegaard meets this claim and assertion by the proposition that logic does not and cannot define reality that it merely predisposes reality for our knowledge without itself coming into contact with its actuality with this proposition his anti-intellectualism begins but it by no means ends there and although this attitude toward logic is the primary concern of the present paper 
i wish also to indicate very summarily and only by way of introduction the philosophical advance which she has made in the application of this initial proposition to more concrete problems the chief forms of positive objective knowledge mathematics the historical disciplines sense perception and the natural sciences which rest upon perception and metaphysics are subjected to a critical estimate in the endeavor to establish the fundamental fact that these disciplines despite their real and obvious value kierkegaard is no obscurantist when viewed as revelations of reality suffer from two fundamental defects of abstraction first they are either entirely hypothetical in their application to reality as in the case of logic and mathematics or they are endless approximations to the truth as in the case of history and the natural sciences secondly they are and indeed wish to be purely objective disciplines as such they realize a knowledge which from the standpoint of the real knower is non-essential since it does not express his actual and concrete position in existence hence they do not essentially concern him but concern merely a fictitious objective subject in general not identical with any concrete human being in the last analysis the degree and scope of such knowledge is a matter of indifference and only knowledge whose relation to existence is essential is essential knowledge no form of positive objective knowledge no logical system no metaphysical result a metaphysical system embracing reality is an illusion can attain to a truth in which reality is adequately and definitively revealed if the problem of truth and reality is not to be given up in despair one must seek for a solution elsewhere and seek for it in another spirit there is but one other sphere in which such a solution can be sought and this is the sphere of the subjective attitude of the knower the realm of the subjective how as distinct from the objective what such is the fruitful turn which kierkegaard gives to an analysis of the adequacy of knowledge that is nearly as old as thought and which according to the temperament of the philosopher has served variously as a starting point for skepticism for positivism for relativism for mysticism or for an abstract idealism kierkegaard makes it the point of departure for an elaborate and profound critique of the personality in its chief subjective modes in order to discover a how which shall adequately express and grasp the real in its human accessibility and concreteness he offers us a delineation of the whole range of typical subjective life attitudes describing them in their ideal self-consistency and sharpness of distinction in this way he presents a variety of ascetic points of view from hardened understanding to sympathetic egoistic melancholy ascetic and ethical despair in many forms prudent eudemonism and worldly wisdom executive irony or irony as a fundamental attitude toward life ethical self-assertion in terms of moral courage and pathos marriage as the most concrete ethical realization of life the struggles of conscience and remorse under exceptional and irregular conditions for the purpose of throwing light upon the normal humor and resignation religion the forms of the religious attitude are reduced ultimately to two which kierkegaard regards as fundamental imminent religion and transcendent religion the latter being distinguished from the former by the decisiveness with which it grasps and the passionate concreteness with which it expresses the deepest paradox of life this critique of the personality is evidently equivalent to a philosophy of values but the uniqueness of kierkegaard's contribution to such a philosophy lies in the fact 
that the evaluations of life which form its subject matter are by his method made to reveal themselves and therefore in a sense to criticize themselves through representative personalities they are embodied in the self-expression of a variety of authors or pseudonyms whose ideas constitute typical and rival views of life the results of this dramatic and imaginative exploration of the personality are abstractly summarized and culminate in the definition of truth as subjectivity raised to the highest intensity of which it is capable or in order to make explicit its negative relation to the objective as the objectively uncertain held fast in subjective inwardness with the highest possible degree of passionate appropriation this formula also defines faith which is the subject's mode of apprehending the truth sensu eminenti a more concrete and epigrammatic characterization of the truth is embodied in the maxim only the truth which edifies is truth for you this is evidently a concrete way of acknowledging the individual himself as the test and standard of truth not indeed in the sense of protagoras but in the opposite sense of socrates know thyself becomes the ultimate categorical imperative this self is not however a transcendental ego serving as a starting point for metaphysical speculation as in fichte it is very simply the concrete personality that constitutes for each one his appropriate ethical task realistically the above definition of truth involves the consequence that the only reality accessible to any existing individual is his own ethical reality to every reality outside the individual even his own external reality his highest valid relation is cognitive but knowledge is a grasp of the possible and not a realization of the actual the knowledge of actualities transmutes them into possibilities and the highest intellectual validity of knowledge is attained in an even balancing of alternative possibilities with an absolutely open mind each of the brief characterizing phrases used in the above schematic outline stands for an entire section or volume in kierkegaard's comprehensive literature of the personality and he has himself given the content of these treatises an abstract categorical formulation conceived with almost algebraic exactness this is indeed a brilliant double achievement by the recognition of which kierkegaard's permanent fame as a thinker will be historically assured we now pass to a more detailed consideration of kierkegaard's estimate of logic formally taking up the reasons which constitute his critique of intellectualism these reasons may be summarized under four principal heads one logic cannot from its own resources provide for transitions from one quality to another in the world of fact such transitions take place by a leap two logic cannot acknowledge within its own sphere the contingent but the contingent is an essential constituent of the actual three logic deals only with universals the particular however is absolutely inseparable from the actual four logic deals only with essences whose being consists in their conceivability factual existence is not an essence and it involves a kind of being which cannot be logically conceived let us consider each of these points in turn a a logical transition from one quality to another is impossible the static character of the concept has often been contrasted with the dynamic character of temporal experience sometimes with the intent of proving the concept and sometimes temporal experience unfit for knowledge of course we may define knowledge in different ways but in the generally accepted meaning it would seem to be this static characteristic of the concept which makes knowledge of a changing experience possible 
Kierkegaard succeeds, perhaps, in obviating much superficial misunderstanding of the doctrine of the static concept, by formulating the distinction between a logical and an actual transition, and in calling attention to the fact that the change from one concept to another, whether in the revision of judgment or in the course of history, is not logical, but actual a concept does not change itself either into its opposite or into a mere other but reality makes a transition from one concept to another by means of a leap in logic everything is and nothing comes into being a truth which the eleatic philosophy transferred to the realm of factual existence in consequence of a misunderstanding in a logical system of concepts every movement is imminent since the relations by which the system is constituted are by the existence of the system rendered internal relations the whole is therefore presupposed in every part and that which emerges from the logical development of such a system is exactly the same as that which was there at the beginning footnote hence when logic rejoices in the orderly beauty of its ballet of the categories it is pledged not to forget that this ballet is devoid of all actual motion reason enough for its unearthly character and footnote movement transition mediation are all transcendent concepts and have no legitimate place in logic to ignore this is to confuse both logic and the historical sciences where these concepts belong and makes ethics impossible for it leads to the misunderstanding that the actual whether past or future may be viewed as necessary by this interpretation all real movement is taken away from history and from the individual life and the illusory introduction of movement into logic is a very poor substitute for such an irreparable loss in the realm of the actual transitions come to pass this is the essential nature of existence its salient characteristic is change and striving which is the source of all its pathos all actual transition involves a breach of continuity a leap the leap is present in manifold forms and it is one of the most important of philosophical problems to distinguish between transitions of different orders footnote for the sake of greater clearness i append a few examples culled mostly from material in kierkegaard's journal h two plus o becomes water and water becomes ice by a leap the change from motion to rest or vice versa is a transition which cannot be logically construed this is the basic principle of zeno's dialectic and is also expressed in newton's laws of motion since the external force by which such change is affected is not a consequence of the law but is premised as external to the system with which we start it is therefore transcendent and non-rational and its coming into existence can only be apprehended as a leap in the same manner every causal system presupposes an external environment as a condition of change every transition from the detail of an empirical induction to the ideality and universality of law is a leap in the actual process of thinking we have the leap by which we arrive at the understanding of an idea or an author kierkegaard finds a pardonable pleasure in noting the inconsistency of certain followers of hegel who have tried to invest with romantic glamour the experience by which they awoke to an understanding of his philosophy as if a man were to boast of the miracle by which he became an adherent of the philosophy which denies all miracles the change from scepticism to belief is a leap of fundamental importance a radical doubt cannot work itself out into belief by an imminent development of its presuppositions in spite of the fact exploited by a too facile idealism that scepticism always posits an abstract certainty in the background 
doubt consists in falsely interpreting this certainty hence it cannot be overcome except by the assumption of a new point of departure reached in a decision of the will in the inner life the radical transitions are not merely given but must be achieved as an expression of freedom they are therefore both non-logical and pathetic the breach of continuity which they involve necessitates an experience surcharged with pathos thus the transition from ascetic eudaemonism to ethics or from the contemplation of nature to the idea of god or from an intellectual knowledge of the good to its ethical realization is in each case the pathetic transition compare soren kierkegaard's papyri five pages three seventy one through three seventy five the most significant and decisive are those which take place in the ethical religious life of the individual this is the sphere of the essentially qualitative distinctions but every leap possesses the logically negative character that it cannot be construed except out of an imminence which has first included it and the gap between two qualities can never be bridged by a demonstration it must either be given or be achieved the historical actuality is thus marked by a transition to the new as a leap whence is derived the sense of wonder wonder is the philosopher's receptivity for the historically new under a logical construction of history wonder would be abolished for who could possibly wonder at a necessary construction footnote philosophical fragments page seventy four compare aristotle's remark that science tends to abolish wonder by exhibiting as necessary that which at first appears to be contingent citing the example of a geometrician who has demonstrated the incommensurability subsisting between the circumference of the circle and its diameter and footnote but such a construction of history is illusory as every one would easily understand if he attempted to construe the life of a single individual say his own kierkegaard pithily remarks that the hegelian interpretation of history helps us understand the past by apprehending it as if it had never been present or future it interprets the heroes of the past as if they had never been alive and it seeks to aid us to an understanding of ourselves by treating us as if we were dead footnote misled by the constant reference to a continued process in which opposites come together in a higher unity and so again in a higher unity etc a parallel has been drawn between hegel's doctrine and that of heraclitus that everything is in a state of flux but this is a misunderstanding since everything that hegel says about process and becoming is illusory hence the system lacks an ethic and hence the system knows nothing when it is asked in real earnest by the living generation and the living individual to explain becoming in order namely that the individual may learn how to act and live in spite of all that is said about process hegel does not understand the world process from the point of view of becoming but understands it by help of the illusion incident to pastness from the point of view of finality where all becoming is excluded hence it is impossible for hegelian to understand himself by means of his philosophy for he can only understand that which is past and finished but a living person is surely not yet deceased possibly he finds consolation in the thought that when one can understand china and persia and six thousand years of world's history the understanding of a particular individual matters very little even if that individual happens to be oneself to me it does not seem so and i understand it better conversely that he who is unable to understand himself must have a somewhat peculiar understanding of china and persia etc footnote unscientific postscript page two sixty three compare also 
james a pluralistic universe pages 243 and 244 where kierkegaard is quoted footnote. the futility of this kind of explanation of life and the need of replacing it by an interpretation more human is expressed in the following epigram from one of his journals the motto of all philosophy hitherto has been there is nothing new under the sun the motto of the new danish philosophy will be there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy b logic cannot assimilate or acknowledge the contingent aspect of the actual within its own realm of truth this is an immediate consequence of the fact that change transcends the sphere of logic since change is a contingency in a logical system all relations are necessary precisely because in such a system no changes actually take place hence the logical as the necessary cannot exist for everything that exists has come into being i e has suffered the change involved in passing from potentiality to actuality this change the necessary cannot undergo the necessary is and never comes to be its being is subspecie aeternitatis in the realm which is the essential medium of thought in logic every movement is in consequence of a logical ground and is hence both necessary and imminent in reality nothing happens in consequence of a ground but everything takes place by virtue of a cause the apparent necessity of a natural law binding cause to effect is no real or unconditional necessity the appearance of necessity arises through an abstraction from the fact that the causes the secondary causes have themselves come into being and by the forgetfulness of the fact that their becoming is not explained but only presupposed by the law should such forgetfulness perhaps also be necessary the past is indeed unchangeable but it does not share the unchangeableness of the necessary for when the past came to be it did not exclude the change by which it came to be but the necessary excludes every change the possibility of a systematic apprehension of the past ex post facto cannot alter the fact that the past is not more necessary than the future just as the optical illusion of seeing the square tower round is one which is induced by distance in space so the intellectual illusion of apprehending the past as necessary is induced by distance in time c the incommensurability between the universal and the particular reveals the impotence of logic in its attempt to define the actual the logical concept is always a universal and even the so-called concrete universal is not concrete in the same sense that the actual is concrete for the particular qua particular is essential to the actual and repels every attempt to conceive it logically when abstract thought tries to conceive the particular it transforms it into a universal to ask what reality is in general is one thing to ask what it means to call this particular thing or situation a reality by bringing the ideality of thought to bear upon its concrete particularity is an absolutely different thing the former question is perhaps not even legitimate in any case the question and answer remain within the sphere of the abstract and do not reach reality as actual the latter question is a concrete question and cannot be put in a logical or metaphysical system or in any science it can only be answered by the individual as an individual who finds in the definiteness of time and space the particularization of his experience and his thought abstract thought solves all the difficulties of life by abstracting from them whence arises its complacent disinterestedness the concrete thinker who faces the concrete problem of reality as above specified discovers that this problem brings his subjective interest to a climax 
since it reveals a future presenting a critical and decisive alternative for abstract thought there is no either or no absolute disjunction why in the world should there be since abstract thought abstracts from existence where the absolute disjunction belongs but for the thinker who faces the future with the subjective passion inherent in voluntary action sensu immanenti there exists an absolute disjunction a valid contradictory opposition whoever attempts to take this way takes existence away and does not therefore take it away in existence on the universality of the universal rests the possibility of communication and on its validity rests the acknowledgment of the existence of other selves the universal is that which is common to different thinkers or to the same thinker at different times footnote the egocentric predicament is an imperfect expression for the more fundamental present moment predicament it is just as impossible to know one's own past or conceive one's own future or realize the full significance of one's own present without assuming the validity of universals as it is to conceive the possibility or acknowledge the reality of another person without making the same assumption to characterize the universal as indeterminateness of meaning is confusing since it needlessly breaks with traditional terminology and necessitates distinguishing between two kinds of indeterminateness one of which is sui generis to call universals dead dictionary definitions verbal forms without content is likewise confusing it is excusable only as a sort of vehement argumentum ad hominem relevant to a particular misuse of the universal but not tending to clarify logical terminology End of footnote. but the incommensurability between the universal and the particular makes doubt and belief truth and error possible when i interpret a particular sense impression as a star i give it a place in a conceptual order and when i interpret it as the same star which i saw yesterday or a year ago or as a star which my neighbor means or sees or as a star which once came into existence whether an instant or ages ago makes no essential difference i am in these interpretations or judgments identifying a present immediacy of sense with some conceptuality of memory or imagination skepticism is a protest of the will against every such identification on the ground that it involves an inference transcending the immediately given and because it is impossible to prove that such inferences may not turn out to be erroneous belief is a contrary movement of the will an affirmation which recognizes that another interpretation is possible but nevertheless risks the assertion of this interpretation as real that alternative interpretations are always possible is most frequently a latent consciousness stupid and passionate people ignore it and the immediate suggestions of sense together with the familiarity of the habitual not to speak of the partiality of the will tend to lull this consciousness to sleep on the other hand the experience of air tends to arouse the mind from its dogmatic slumbers thus positing the choice between belief and belief or between belief and doubt footnote the philosophers who confidently appeal to experience spelled like the absolute with a capital as the adequate imminent guarantee for the security of judgment seem not to have learned from experience that the consequences always come last and cannot therefore be appealed to in the moment of judgment their utility for the shaping of future judgments never reaches the point where it abolishes the risk of error or the incommensurability between the given and the inferred on the other hand the idealists seek to heal the open wound of this situation by reference to an absolute knower 
failing to realize the power of the actual uncertainty and risk of error involved to depress the ideal certainty which the absolute knower possesses to the status of an abstract possibility other motives than those derivable from the realm of epistemology are necessary in order to transmute this abstract conception into a concrete faith in a real actuality but by this transference of the problem from the logical to the ethical ascetic sphere the content of the conception is radically altered and we pass from the absolute of metaphysics to the god of religion End of footnote in the inner life of the self the contrast between the universal and the particular finds its highest significance the self is a synthesis of the universal and the particular the ethical individual has a task of realizing the universal man in a concrete particular embodiment and the individual is both himself and the race the ethical solution of this contradiction constitutes the history of the individual by which he also participates in the history of the race and is essentially interested in the history of every other individual here lie all the ethical and religious problems of the individual life d heterogeneity of the logical and the actual is revealed finally in the fact that logic deals only with essences or qualities factual existence which is the mark of actuality is not an essence or a quality and the difference between the possible and the actual is logically non-determinable because the change from the one to the other is not a change of essence but a change of being footnote philosophical fragments chapter three and melonspill it is this transition which as bergson teaches offers a problem that no intellectual knowledge succeeds in solving kierkegaard insists that the problem is irrelevant to knowledge as such and that the attempt to find a new form of knowledge that solves the problem intuition is illusory and a footnote from this follow two important consequences it becomes evident that demonstration or proof with reference to existence is a misunderstanding and that to speak of degrees of reality without clearly distinguishing between ideal reality and factual existence involves a similar misunderstanding it is impossible to reach existence by means of a demonstration all demonstration operates by essences or quails and their existence is either assumed or irrelevant the objective existence of the essences postulated by logic is simply their reality for thought but is not their factual existence hence i can never demonstrate the existence of a stone or a star but only that some existing thing is a stone or a star the testimony offered in the court of justice is not for the purpose of proving that a criminal exists but in order to show that the accused whose existence is given is a criminal it cannot be proved that god exists every such attempt inevitably reduces itself to a development of the consequences which flow from having assumed his existence i e to a making explicit the logical content of the conception of god if god does not exist of course it is impossible to prove his existence but if he does exist it would be the height of folly to attempt it the procedure has ascetically the form of an insult as if one were to assume to demonstrate in the presence of someone that he exists for existence is higher than demonstration and requires a more adequate form of acknowledgment the only adequate expression for the existence of god is worship and the attempt to demonstrate it is consciously or unconsciously to ignore his existence i e his presence all reasoning is from existence and no reasoning is toward existence factual existence not being a quality is not subject to distinctions of degree a fly if it exists has precisely as much existence as a god the dialectic of existence is the dialectic of hamlet to be or not to be 
ideally it is not improper to speak of degrees of reality but when we deal with reality from the ideal point of view we do not deal with factual existence but with ideal essence spinoza's proof for the existence of god is thus a profound tautology resting on the identification of reality with perfection it avoids the real difficulty which is to bring god's ideal essence into relation with factual existence the category which relates the ideal to the actual is the possible and knowledge is always a system of possibilities intellectually and aesthetically though not ethically the possible is higher than the actual just as aristotle says that poetry is more philosophical than history belief is the application of knowledge to the determination of the actual and constitutes our point of contact with the historical as such the historical comes into being by setting aside the antecedent alternative possibilities in precisely analogous fashion belief comes into existence by setting aside as invalid the alternative possibilities of knowledge and just as the former transition is a leap which cannot be logically construed so the latter transition the transition from the many possibilities of knowledge to the one reality of belief is not necessitated by knowledge but is an act of the will footnote the reader will note the identity of what is here called belief with what modern logic calls judgment as something distinct from the ideal content of propositions and a footnote the choice of the will in believing is the means whereby the personality constitutes expresses and reveals itself on the different levels of its subjectivity every deeper ethical religious conviction as an interpretation of the universe and of life is an expression of the inner depths of the personality rather than a necessary consequence of knowledge faith is never grounded in the objective necessities of logic or of metaphysics and its firm conviction is incommensurable with the approximations and probabilities of history or of natural science it is forever transcendent of every positive external objectivity and its object exists only for the infinite subjective interest in which and through which it lives and works footnote for kierkegaard faith is by no means objectless but its object is not given positively outside the individual but only negatively within the individual there is an absolute correspondence between the nature of this object and the individual's subjective mode of apprehending it kierkegaard's achievement is so to have defined this subjective mode as uniquely to determine the object to which it corresponds End of footnote. such is in brief outline and largely in free paraphrase kierkegaard's anti-intellectualism viewed from the standpoint of logic the reader may wish to compare these views with current attacks upon formal logic and with the radical evolutionism of bergson the attacks upon logic charge that this discipline or no discipline as the impetuosity of its critics leads them to stamp it does not describe actual thinking does not reveal the actual motives of thought and does not explain the actual progress of knowledge this is evidently the same contrast between the formal and the actual which kierkegaard has attempted to illuminate and to interpret when compared with bergson kierkegaard's position shows both essential resemblances and essential differences but the comparison raises so many problems that the present paper cannot undertake even to mention them current controversy is almost wholly preoccupied with the problem of knowledge leaving the problem of action far in the background it is here however that the distinction between intellectualism and its antithesis is most sharply defined for the mere knower is not as such the concretely real subject as knower he makes an effort the better to realize the functions of science 
to abstract from his real existence it is by such an abstraction that he seeks to become disinterested and objective and to identify himself as far as may be with the objectivity that he knows it is true that this undertaking is but an approximation and is never completely successful but it is folly to ignore the reality of the effort and futile to deny that it may and does meet with a relatively adequate degree of success on the other hand it is surely necessary for every thinker to understand what relation his abstract thought and objective knowledge bear to life if he seeks to forget life in a complete absorption in the tasks of objective thought or assumes that the latter is the highest and noblest human pursuit then he becomes as kierkegaard has shown in a style and manner worthy to be ranked as classic personally insignificant and fundamentally a comic figure a type of the absent-minded professor whose real life is lived in distraction and who even marries in distraction this species of abstract thinker kierkegaard has immortalized in the figure of the privadocent with greater objectivity than schopenhauer but with a point of view akin to his he has drawn the picture of the professor of philosophy in the german sense who is bound a tout prix to explain everything over against this picture he sets the ideal of the thinker in the greek sense whose life is an attempt artistically to realize his thought and who does not therefore need many thoughts all valid to a certain extent but is satisfied with one thought which is absolute david f swenson university of minnesota end of the anti-intellectualism of kierkegaard by david f swenson published in nineteen sixteen